Well, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> my experiences with being uh, at that particular disaster 25 years ago. Uh, at the time, I was the director of the uh, solid rocket motor project for Martin Thackall, who makes the solid rocket boosters. And I was in the launch control center when that launch occurred. And to me, remembering that it was more disturbing what I remember from the day before than the accident itself because uh, the night before that launch, uh, uh, many of our engineers as well as myself were concerned about the forecast of the cold temperatures were expected during the launch window. And as a result of that, I uh, asked the engineers back in Utah that our plant was to examine that impact to see if we had any concerns about our hardware, and particularly the O-ring seals, which I was worried about how well they would operate at those kind of temperatures. And uh, frankly, uh, they did that, and I arranged for a teleconference where our engineering people were in contact with the people at Kennedy and also all the NASA engineering people in Huntsville, Alabama <coughs> at Marshall Space Flight Center. And they presented their case, and, and basically the result of that was the Vice President of Engineering of the company recommended to NASA not to launch below 53 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Uh, what really surprised me, being at the Cape, because uh, in my past experience was is they were always uh, uh, looking for safety and, and never compromise that, a, they questioned the basis for making such a recommendation and felt it was overly restrictive, uh, primarily because it was based on an observation from one year earlier in January of 1985 when we pulled these boosters out of the ocean, pulled them apart. Uh, we saw evidence of some soot gas getting past one of the O-rings in these field joints, and they're called field joints because they're mated like a tongue and groove mm -hmm. at the cape four segments stacked on top of each other. And that <clears throat> particular observation indicated for whatever reason, for some short period of time, gas went past the first seal, stopped by the second. And that's the first time we'd ever seen that in a field joint of a solid rocket booster. And our conclusion was, is the reason that happened with that particular flight was that was the coldest flight mm -hmm. in, in the shuttle program up to that time about 53 degrees. So the engineers were reluctant to recommend uh, flying at a temperature below that one because that one had a <coughs> evidence of a potential problem and we didn't know how close we were to a clip. Uh, but NASA felt that it wasn't overwhelming evidence because we only had one other similar observation of some gas getting past a primary seal. And that was in the fall of 1985, and it happened to be one of the warmer launches. Mm -hmm. uh, but the engineers who had re-examined this and, and looked at those joints made it very clear that the one that was warm had very little soot. It was very light gray in color, and penetrate much past the joint, very small quantity. While this one that was cold had a huge amount, mm -hmm. went all the way around the joint, and in their opinion, they felt that just the difference in those two was due to temperature. And the joint may well be uh, marginal at regular temperatures, you know, so, and therefore in the uh, uh, interest of safety, they wouldn't recommend we proceed to go any colder. Well, NASA felt that that observation was, you know, strictly uh, uh, qual qualitative in, in nature, and asked for some quantitative assessment that says that we can't launch at temperatures below that. There was no analysis done, presented, and are sure that we uh, have enough information to support such a restriction on the shuttle. And as a result of those comments, uh, uh, my boss, who was the vice president of space programs back there, uh, asked for a caucus to make sure that they had uh, used all the information available to them and where they could run some analysis that would support that position, or if there's a, another position they could support better with some more rigorous analysis. Uh, they asked for five minutes, so I took about a half hour, and a half hour later they came back, and, and basically it wasn't the Vice President of Engineering making the recommendation anymore, that I had asked for an engineering recommendation, it was my boss and program office. And he just basically said they'd reassessed all the data, 
and have concluded that it's okay to proceed with the launch as planned, with no particular mm -hmm. temperature restriction. <clears throat> Uh, I was kind of taken aback by that, being at the Cape, because I didn't hear any rationalization that changed mm -hmm. my mind that the original recommendation wasn't correct. Uh, so then NASA said, well, you know, we need to have that recommendation in writing, signed by a responsible call official. Uh, I knew who that responsible call official was, it was me. Mm -hmm. And I made the uh, smartest decision I made in my entire life is I refused to sign it. Uh, as a result of that, my boss had to sign it back in Utah and fax it down to me. And uh, while we were waiting for that fax, uh, I was uh, so concerned about that, I told the people at NASA, I said, you know, you can't accept that recommendation, and I don't care who made it. Mm -hmm. They said, what do you mean? I said, because as far as I know, and you know, those solid rocket boosters are supposed to be qualified to fly from 40 degrees to 90 degrees. And we're looking at potential temperatures in the 20s tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And you can't approve a launch that flies outside of what the hardware is qualified to fly in. And it was silence. Nobody responded. So I said, well, let me tell you something. I sure hope nothing happens tomorrow. But if it does, I'm not going to be the person to stand before a part of inquiry and explain why I gave you permission to fly our hardware outside of what I know is qualified to. Mm -hmm. I still didn't get any response. So I said, well, uh, if I were the launch director, I'll tell you I would cancel this launch for three reasons, not just one. First one being this overing concern that we've been discussing for the last couple hours. But there's two others. I said, I talked to our... Uh, Vice President of Space Services, who's been in communication with our ships out at sea that recover these boosters, and they're in uh, they're in 30-foot seas, 50 knots, gusting to 75, mm -hmm. and they're headed straight into shore in a survival mode. They won't even be out there to recover the boosters in the morning. Third reason is I heard the uh, plan for freeze protection uh, for the launch support systems that have a lot of water in them. Mm -hmm. uh, what they're going to do is keep the pipes from breaking, they're just going to leave the spigots open overnight. And my guess is there's going to be ice all over that place sure. tomorrow morning. And I said, uh, I'm recommending that we do not launch, not based on what I know, but what I do not know, and you're in the same position. And their response was, Al, uh, these aren't your concerns, but we will pass them on in an advisory capacity. Uh, then. What surprised me more after the failure occurred the next day when I was sitting in the launch control center and the first thing I did was sit on my computer and turn the TV cameras on and the cameras that they had in various places on the launch pad and saw this ice hanging over, I was convinced that they'll never launch anyway. But they actually had two separate holes where they went out and actually knocked the ice down as best they could and uh, prepared for launch. And uh, what I didn't know at the time was when those ice team went down there to remove the ice and, and make those observations, they also measured some temperatures on various elements of the shuttle as well as structure around there. And for some strange reason, they measured a very low temperature on the right solid rocket booster aft field joint. Uh, and they recorded in the log, it was like nine degrees. Uh, and just below it, seven degrees. And uh, when the ice team came back to report their assessment, that part of the information is not a requirement for launch commit. The launch commit requirement is an ice assessment. How much ice is there that one could cause a penalty in performance of the vehicle that's too thick because it weighs so much, and two, the potential for debris. And they have a kind of a standard that goes in this standard because they get the ice even if it's very warm outside right. uh, because of the cryogens in the tank. Mm -hmm. And they concluded that that was within an acceptable standard and, and proceeded to go ahead with the launch. Uh, it wasn't until the Presidential Commission uh, was formed 
And the testimony subsequently I heard that I was shocked to find out that the NASA folks that I argued with, one of whom was part of the mission management team, who was one of the members, never mentioned a single thing about our concern, much less a recommendation in the first place not to launch. And uh, I had to bring that forward to the commission voluntarily and tell them that they hadn't really heard the whole story. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, as soon as I did that, my uh, uh, when I went home, my company said I'm no longer the director of the program, and uh, I'm now head of scheduling or something. And it was clearly a non-job to uh, okay. get me to I quit. Uh, I didn't do it. I was part of the failure team at that time, and they removed me from that. And I had given NASA a detailed analysis of failure within a few days of the accident. That all of the data met, all the films met, and it was very clear they didn't want to hear it because it was a byproduct of the very problem we had addressed the night before. And uh, so that's kind of tough to live with, and, but fortunately that story got to the commission, and uh, even though I was set aside for a period of time, I uh, eventually got reinstated. Uh, at the time, the circumstances that caused that I didn't know about, but uh, uh, I had went back to uh, a meeting in May of 1986 after I'd been removed in February <clears throat> from my position uh, and I was back to a meeting in Washington for the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics because I was the chairman of the Solid Rocket Technical Committee for them, I had been for the past two years, and I was handing my gavel over to the new chairman who was elected. And as part of that uh, uh, meeting, there's an annual conference there and they were having a keynote address about what uh, poor shape we are for space launch because of the failure of the uh, Challenger in January, but also a Titan that failed in April of 1986. <clears throat> and the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, Pete Aldridge, was supposed to give that address, but he didn't show up. But who did show up was uh, General Don Katina, who happened to be a member of the Presidential Commission. And he gave the address, and I sat down in the front row, and, and when he got done, he came walking down, and he says, Al, uh, what are you doing here? He said, you haven't got time to be sitting here listening to this rhetoric and how we're going to crowd this horrible problem we're in. He said, you ought to be spending all of your time figuring out why the shuttle failed the way it did. Well, I said, I'm not doing that. He said, well, you're part of the failure team, aren't you? And I said, well, I used to be, but I'm not anymore. He says, when did that happen? And I said, well, I got removed from that. Uh, it happened, I think it was the day after I testified before you people. He said, you're kidding me. I said, no, I'm not. He said, we'll fix that problem. He immediately went to Chairman Rogers, and uh, they uh, called my senior management, had a, a special meeting with them, and read them the riot act. Uh, shortly before they issued their final report to the president, I was called in and said, uh, Al, you're going to be ahead of the uh, redesign for uh, Backhaul and NASA for fixing the problem, getting the shuttle back to safe flight as soon as possible. And uh, to me, that was good news because that's something I wanted to do. I knew how to fix it. Mm -hmm. And I said, I can now forget about what could have been in the past and, and work on preventing anything in the future. And I felt good about that until about two months later, I got a telephone call. And the telephone call was from Congressman Markey at that time in Massachusetts. And he says, uh, Mr. McDonald, is it really true what I read in the New York Times that you're heading this whole big team to uh, redesign and put the shuttle back in a safe flight? Or is that just some facade that your company is releasing to the press to make it appear like you've got some big important job and they've got you doing some menial task? I says, well, I've been working seven days a week, 16 hours a day. Uh, and yeah, I really am ahead of that. And doing that, I says, do you know something I don't know? And he said, well, uh, you're certainly aware of House Joint Re Resolution 634 on you. And I says, no, what's that? He said, well, that was a bill that was introduced uh, in your name and, and was passed by both the House and the Senate to reinstate you to your position. I said, well, really? He said, yeah. I said, would you like to have a copy of that? I said, yeah, I'd kind of like mm -hmm. to have a copy of that. He said, well, I'll send you that along with a copy we sent to your CEO in Chicago. And he said, I'll also send you a, a letter that uh, some of my colleagues in the Senate, uh, namely uh, uh, Gore and uh, 
and, and others have sent to uh, the NASA administrator that basically says the same thing. And, and I got that letter and what it basically said was if they didn't reinstate me to a position equivalent to one I had before I testified before the commission, uh, that they would not only cancel the existing contract my company had on a shuttle, but they would ban my company from ever having a contract in the future with NASA. Wow. Uh, not a small amount of leverage. Mm -hmm. Now, that was kind of a bittersweet news for me because I thought they chose me to take on this job because I was the most qualified individual to make it happen, which seemed almost impossible at that time. But I realized they really didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. But uh, on the brighter side of that, we were very successful. So successful as the safest piece of hardware on the shuttle today. At 110 straight flights, and they brought those boosters out of the ocean, and they're all just pristine. And in fact, uh, they're, they're, they were so good that it was the uh, preference for the uh, replacement of shuttle to be essentially a stretched version of the solid rocket boosters. And the astronauts felt more felt more comfortable about them, and they were flying on. Them. So, unfortunately, that program's kind of in limbo. And that was the Constellation program by the current budget problems and administration and doesn't look like it's uh, it's going to happen, but I felt good about uh, that redesign and how well it performed. I want to talk about that a little bit too, but I want to first go back to you know the day of the launch. Talk mm -hmm. a bit about that. I mean, you you knew what might happen. You knew all the risks. You knew some of the things that were going to go on. You knew your recommendations. You knew their reaction to that. Um, what was it like during the actual launch, leading up to that, and then the actual failure, and then the, the moments after that for you? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I didn't really expect them to launch because when I saw this ice, I thought, sure, they would cancel it. And they wouldn't accept feeling that they could just knock enough of it down because some of it they couldn't get off. And, and because of the debris issue, frankly. And I didn't know at the time that Rockwell really uh, opposed the launch because of their concern of the debris, ice debris issue. So I didn't really think it happened. But when they decided to resume the count, and I was sitting there with my headset, and I was on the assumption that they had considered everything, including the discussions we had, and decided it was still an acceptable risk to go ahead. And my feeling was that if these O-rings leaked because of the cold weather that we were worried about the night before, it would happen in the first six-tenths of a second from ignition. Because that's when the whole case pressurizes and this problem develops with the O-rings keeping contact. And if that happened, the whole shuttle system would explode before it cleared the tower, mm -hmm. which would have been a horrifying thought. But that did not happen. It flew just fine. So my heart started beating again when it cleared the tower, because I figured we had dodged a bullet, we were just fine, and then this whole thing exploded 73 seconds later. And it was a shock to everybody in that room. You could have heard a pin drop. Uh, and all I heard on the network was somebody saying RTLS, RTLS, which is return to launch site, hoping that the orbiter some way was still intact and could come back. And of course it wasn't. Uh, and I could hear some people sobbing in the background, crying, because they knew what happened, as did I. <clears throat> but. As horrible as it was, I did not think it was the solid rocket boosters that caused the problem. In fact, my initial reaction was, the only thing I know that did not cause the problem was the solid rocket boosters. Because the only thing I could see flying on this huge explosion were the two solid rocket boosters, intact. The rest of the whole thing had disappeared. So my immediate reaction was, is it was some other problem, probably a main engine turbine or or a tank structure problem or something, but not the solid rocket boosters. We'll come to find out later. And uh, it wasn't until the next day I flew to uh, the Marshall Space Flight Center to join the failure team for the rocket propulsion for the solid rocket boosters. And when we saw a film they brought up from Kennedy showing this plume coming out the side that penetrated the tank that caused the explosion. And I asked him at that time, I said, we don't understand how that could happen uh, if an O-ring leaked because it looked like that plume was in the vicinity of where we had mm -hmm. these O-rings. Uh, do you have a film 
uh, of the shuttle on the launch pad, right at ignition, focused right towards that same place we saw this balloon in flight. And they looked in their lives, yeah, we do. They developed the film immediately and came back and said, uh, gee, uh, we don't have that uh, film because that camera froze up and they had no film. But they had one located uh, 50, 60 degrees away that wasn't directly into the area but showed this big, huge black smoke, puff of smoke coming right out of the joint at six tenths of a second. Mm -hmm. So at that point, my heart sank because I realized that, you no, know, that whole failure occurred from the very problem we had raised the night before and tried to prevent, that it really did leak the ignition because it was so cold. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't until uh, a couple of days later I found some data in the ice team's report on these temperatures. They were sharp. One was nine, one was seven. And I said, uh, where are these locations on these station numbers? So it happened it was the right solid rocket booster aft field joint area, the one that failed. And I said, well, I think I found the uh, silver bullet that goes with the smoking gun. That's why that joint failed and the other five worked just fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I presented that to NASA, it was clear to me they didn't want to hear it. <laughs> didn't want to hear that story, and uh, in fact, uh, they claimed that the optical pyrometer that made those temperature measurements was in error. It uh, had a collaboration problem going from a warm box at 80 degrees to the cold mm -hmm. local environment. It wasn't stabilized, and calibrations and things like this, so they actually increased all those numbers in, in the report they gave the commission. Is that right? Yes. And corrected them. They said they corrected them for their proper color. I said, I don't believe that because someplace in that same report I found that that ice team uh, was checking the water underneath the solid rocket boosters that's put there in a quiescent state, just dumped in there as a sound suppression system, mm -hmm. sitting there all night. Mm -hmm. Because of that, they put antifreeze in it. It was good to 16 degrees. It was frozen solid. Really? That morning. So I said, something's going on here that we don't understand, and I think we've got a cryogenic venting problem or leak that caused this local areas to be much colder than the others, because I said the other booster was within a couple of degrees of local ambient temperature most everywhere, as, as the upper part of the right booster was. Something's going on here. Uh, and I told the Presidential Commission that I didn't agree with the report for that reason. Uh, it wasn't until about a year later, after I got put in charge to have the redesign, I had somebody work on trying to develop a computer model of the whole launch environment, and from the tanking and the crowd floods. And uh, what happened was a rare, very rare condition is that if you look at the shuttle when it's being tanked, this beanie cap sits on top of the external tank, it actually carries out the gaseous oxygen mm -hmm. because you have liquid oxygen at minus 297 degrees boiling up there and they bring the vapors off and they dump it into the atmosphere. Well, you have even a bigger problem at the bottom with the hydrogen because it's a minus 423, okay. but they take it out on a line and they flare it like they do in a refinery sure. so the two don't ever get together. Well, so happened this oxygen uh, was coming back on the vehicle because there was a very unusual weather condition there of a very light wind, three to five knots coming from the north-northwest that brought all those vapors back mm -hmm. around the vehicle. And as it was doing that, it was super cooling all the air. And the uh, colder air kept sinking and sinking, getting more dense. And as it went around the tank, it even got colder because the outside surface of the tank. So the right solid rocket booster between it and the uh, tank was the coldest, mm -hmm. especially at the bottom. And, and when they modeled all that, they were able to predict all that raw data uncorrected within a couple of degrees everywhere, and they had about wow. 30 or 40 mission. Wow. But it was, that almost was a year, year and a half after the accident. Mm -hmm. So that was really the major contributor to the accident. It was never reported to the commission. I'm not sure that NASA has never reports yet. It's in my book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well. Here we are 25 years later, where are we? Um, I know that the shuttle program is, is, is winding down, but where are we, what, what have 
What have we, what has NASA, what, what's been learned from all this as, as we stand 25 years later? Well, I think what's uh, been learned from this, and unfortunately we keep relearning it, and we forget it quickly, uh, because as I also describe in the book, there's some similarities to the uh, Columbia accident also that uh, came off Challenger, where we, there were lessons learned but forgotten. But the fundamental lessons are that, first of all, you need to really listen to the professionals and the people that are closest to the issues and the problems. And unfortunately, we've got ourselves in a, a position both in corporate management, government management, of, of managers at the highest levels making decisions uh, to suit their primary purposes in life, which are very much under the pressures of schedules and budgets and dollars and next quarter's earning reports or what mayor or congressman they're talking to or whatever the case may be, influences the immediate decisions. And we've got to get away from that because uh, the people that really understand the issues that raise these concerns are not being listened to. And that happened in Challenger, it happened in Columbia, it happened in the Gulf spill, big time. Very similar trend. So it hasn't went away. Uh, and unfortunately, it's a culture that is part of the problem. Uh, we don't have enough people in management that, that create an atmosphere that their good employees and professionals are willing to tell them the bad news of what they really think. We need to do that because a good manager is a person that uses all the brain power in the room. Mm -hmm. And if they create an atmosphere where everyone's not willing to tell them what they really think, they've shortchanged themselves big time. Maybe one person in that room thought of something that nobody else thought of. But if they don't feel comfortable bringing it forward, then you've lost that information that you should have to be a good manager make a decision. We just need to do that. And, and we'd get rid of a lot of the problems that we have in these areas of bad decision making. Uh, I keep telling uh, uh, new young engineers that uh, one of the lessons I learned from that is when I went and interviewed the people who were in that room when that decision was changed. There were two engineers that never changed their mind and fought the manual saying, we don't think you ought to change your mind. We think that was the right recommendation. And they were basically asked to sit down because they couldn't provide anything new. And, and all of a sudden, the burden of proof got changed because they were asked to prove that it would fail. They could not do that. But that's not the same thing as saying it's safe to fly. Mm -hmm. So that was a lesson learned. You've got to be aware of those kinds of things, dynamics happening. And second thing, I asked the other engineers in the room, there must have been eight or ten of them, uh, did they agree that this recommendation should change and without exception they all said no and I said then why didn't you say something because I said as soon as the general manager said am I the only one that thinks it's okay to go fly as NASA does and, and I said everybody was silent by your silence that was taken as you must support that position mm -hmm. and if you would have all said no there wouldn't have been a manager in the room that would change their mind right. so we need to get professionals standing up and defending their own position have the courage to do it. And in fact, I think it's a responsibility for, for carrying away your diploma from a university. You're now a professional. If somebody's going to ask your professional opinion, you give it to them, whether they like it or they don't. But when you get to be a manager, you make sure you're the one that creates the nice atmosphere that everybody feels comfortable doing that. So that's the lesson I think I learned. And just one last question just about the book. How has it been received? Um, what was it, 2009? Yes, right. it was known as March of 2009. Let's talk about how, how this has been received um, you know, since, since it was put out. Well, I think I'm only 53,985,000 copies below uh, uh, some other authors, and Harry Potter knows, but sure. as far as selling books, but I feel very good about it because uh, it's been, I think, well received primarily in the academic world. I, I have several lectures I give, and in a couple of universities now it's required reading uh, as part of their engineering ethics classes. And uh, I feel good about that, and uh, I think it's been well received by the uh, people that are in the aerospace business and in academics. And in teaching courses on ethics, I spoke at the University of Pittsburgh MBA program about 
a year ago, and I think they may be adopting the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is what I would consider much easier reading than the manuscript I had to my colleague Jim Hansen, because it was more of an engineering report, I think, when I got done, but he made it much more readable without losing any of the real factual content of the book. So I feel good about working with him. He was the right person, and uh, I think it uh, will be around for a while because I think it's a very good detail of what can happen. And uh, the things I went through were, I was telling Jim at lunch, I said, you know, either any one of those single things was kind of a lifetime event. But I went through three or four of them in a row that happened to me as a result of that. But I was fortunate because I had a, uh, a powerful group of people that supported me. People like the Presidential Commission of Congress to reinstate me. Mm -hmm. While most people that would do something like that would be out on the garbage heap someplace and you'd never hear them from them again. So I feel lucky from that uh, perspective. But uh, uh, the only uh, thing we can hope is that we will learn lessons from things like this and prevent the next accident like the Gulf spill from happening. But I, I really get discouraged when I see what happened there uh, because it was very similar.